All right, Alexander, let's talk about what's going on in Pakistan. Um, Imran Khan was, uh, <laughs> what a story this, this has been. He was, going to, he was going to have a no confidence vote about like a week and a half ago. And uh, he managed to avoid that no confidence vote. And uh, it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, no, the no confidence vote is back on the table. You had another no confidence vote. And this time the no confidence vote uh, was against uh, Imran Khan. It went through the, uh, the parliament and they have removed Imran Khan. There's a lot more detail to this story, which you may want to get into. Imran Khan has talked about um, certain documents which implicate uh, the United States pushing for some sort of regime change. You have generals in Pakistan who seem to want Imran Khan out, but Imran Khan is a, is a politician of immense stature, uh, an athletic hero, um, a statesman, and someone who I believe a very large majority of the population in Pakistan uh, support. And we saw that uh, just the other day in massive protests across the entire country, city after city, including the capital of, of protests that really, I mean, just looking at some of the footage, it seemed like entire cities were out on the street supporting Khan against this uh, removal in, uh, in, this in this no confidence vote that took place. Is, is this a regime change? Was this a regime change? And um, how serious is this with regards to Pakistan? Because the same day that Imran Khan was... Uh, lost that no confidence vote, you actually had American uh, cruise missiles hitting Afghanistan. And I think to me that kind of woke me up to the reality, the geopolitical reality of what Pakistan means to, uh, to this uh, global war that we are seeing between say the, the globalist world, world order and this uh, China-Russia fair world order which has been dubbed yeah. by Wang Yi and Lavrov as a fair world order. I mean, Pakistan yeah. is an important piece in this, uh, yes. in this struggle. Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, let's, let's talk about was this a regime change or not? Well, of course, the official story that you get from Washington, but also from Islamabad, from the new government, from the military, from everybody in the, in the power structures, the existing power structures in Pakistan, was it was not that, you know, it's, uh, um, Imran Khan had not been running the economy well, that there'd been great concern because of the, he, the way he handled the pandemic. Um, there's also been criticism, however, of his trip to Moscow, it's felt that he uh, uh, departed from Pakistan's position of neutrality by appearing to be too sympathetic to the Russians. And this was entirely an internal thing and that the United States was not involved in any way. Well, you can believe that if you wish. And if you do wish to believe it, well, I have a very nice bridge. I can tell you because, of course, it was. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt at all that uh, the United States was absolutely furious with Imran Khan. I don't think they've been happy with him for a very long time. I think they've been uh, feeling increasingly that he's not on message where the United States is concerned. And I think they've been angling to get rid of him for, an, for ages. I think also Imran Khan, who is someone with a reputation for probity in Pakistan. Now, this goes back very much to his career as a cricketer. He was an extremely honourable cricketer. Never any criticism of him. He never you know, broke any rules, did anything wrong. He was somebody who was very, very highly regarded as a cricket. I mean, I don't play cricket myself or follow it very well, but I, you know, I can remember people always talking about Imran Khan in Britain, the home of cricket, as an outstandingly uh, honourable man. Anyway, in a system such as Pakistan's, where corruption is very widespread, I think that's an understatement, by the way, Cor corruption is extremely widespread, being an honest person always is something that the rest of the political class is deeply suspicious of. And they're also deeply suspicious of somebody who's come to lead Pakistan, who is a political outsider. You remember how the political class in the United States responded when Donald Trump 
an outsider came in and took over. There's something of that element in Pakistan as well. So eventually, they looked for the opportunity to gang up against them, against him. They got the green light to do it from the United States. More importantly still, they got the green light from the military to do it as well. And they engineered his removal. And they engineered it by getting seven MPs from his coalition to defect. And then when elections were called, they used the Supreme Court to block elections. And of course, you can believe that the Supreme Court acted strictly according to the letter of the Constitution. Maybe it did. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, uh, certainly not where Pakistan's constitution is concerned. And yet still, if you really believe that, I have another bridge to sell you. So that, that, that is why it has been done. Now, having said that, yes, getting rid of Imran Khan means that you're going to get a less, um, um, you know, you know a, a, more, a less independent government in Islamabad. It means you can th shoot, fire your cruise missiles into Afghanistan, which you weren't able to do before. It means that perhaps Pakistan won't vote in the way it's been doing up to now in the General Assembly, where it's been abstaining and this hasn't been the United States hasn't been pleased about that at all. But is all this so important that it is worth the risk of creating destabilization within Pakistan? Well, of course, if you're a neocon, it is. But if you're not a neocon, if you take a more measured, and I would say realistic, and dare I say it, more rational view, you accept that countries and governments have a right to have their own opinion. Sometimes they agree with you, sometimes they don't. If they disagree with you, you take it in your stride, because Pakistan is a big, important country, but it's not ultimately the country that is going to create you know, the big waves in international affairs. It's not India, it's not China, it's not Russia, it's not even Brazil. And you just take it in your stride. But if you are that sort of person, then you're not a neocon. Yeah, for the, well, the neocons have shown that they're willing to destroy Absolutely. countries in order to. Absolutely. To win I mean, this, they, they, this war they against, take no prisoners. I mean, exactly. Yeah. They take no prisoners. They never take. They never do. Just not just against Russia, against anybody. And of course, from their point of view, engineering Imran Khan's removal means that if you are, say, uh, you know, the prime minister of Nigeria you might be a bit more nervous because, you know, if they did this to Imran Khan, well, you know, they could do it to you. So that's partly what this is all about, I think. Um, well, I think it's the message... provoked protests. It provoked protests in Pakistan. It's deepened instability there. It's created a crisis in a part of the world that you would thought is important to the United States. But as I said, the neocons never think forward in that kind of way, and they take no prisoners in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Well, the message for all leaders has been to, to either support what the, what the neocons are doing uh, with regard to, to Russia and Ukraine or else. And I think every leader has been put on notice. Every leader that has taken a neutral or even a semi-neutral stance has been put yes. on notice, and yes. uh, they must yes. be getting nervous. Uh, because well, they will be getting, know, they today will be it's nervous. Imran Khan, tomorrow it's me, but this is going to boomerang against the uh, the United States against the uh, the USD as reserve currency against the petrodollar because while these leaders may be nervous they're also going to be saying you know what uh, deep down inside I'm nervous that the US is going to come for me but deep down inside I really hope that China and Russia pull this off that's what they're saying yeah. that's what MBS is well, saying it. that's what um, um, Obrador in Mexico is saying and he's had to come out with a statement trying yeah, no. to, to appease Washington as well. Today, he came out with a statement. He says, I well, I don't, I don't support what Russia has done, but he didn't go all the way. But you can tell he's no, getting he nervous. Didn't. But no, deep down really inside, they're saying, you know what? I don't appreciate Newland coming to my country and bossing me around. I'll do what I need to do to survive. But boy, I hope uh, uh, these guys come out on top. These other guys come out on Indeed. top. And the people of Pakistan have taken notice, and that's why you saw so many Absolutely. people out on the street. Can people change Absolutely. the outcome of this uh, no-confidence vote? 
difficult in Pakistan, I would guess. I mean, there's supposed to be elections in Pakistan in October, but you know, bear in mind, Pakistan has a long history of military rule, military dictatorships. I would have thought that given what's been done, um, the political class will now close ranks to solidify. And I think that they'll be acting against any protests and any elections um, in, 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 and in elections to prevent Imran Khan coming back because they'll now be very scared of getting him back. So, I mean, you know, there's, that, there's those factors as well. But, you know, that may easily, in a place like Pakistan, feed into the very profound structural instabilities which exist within that country, of which, you know, we're all very familiar with. So, you know, Imran Khan was able to transcend a lot of the divisions in Pakistan. What has been just been done is going to exacerbate those divisions in Pakistan. And as for other world leaders around the world, yes, some of them will be very nervous. Obrador in Mexico is clearly nervous. He's also, by the way, facing a, a domestic challenge. He's got I believe a referendum coming, which has been orchestrated against him. So I mean, you know, he's got he's got those things to worry about. But other leaders pushed in that same way. They will say, "Why? Wow, the Americans may be coming after me. I can't be sure that what I do is always going to uh, satisfy them. So I've got a choice: either I become a yes man, in which case I lose support from my people, and that may be difficult for me." Or I do what the Solomon Islands has just done, and I enter into a security agreement with the other side. <laughs> and don't underestimate the potential for that. I mean, that is exactly what the Solomon Islands, if you think about it, has done. We did a program about it a short while ago. The uh, Solomon Islands, um, by entering into a security agreement with China, has now to some extent got a Chinese protection for itself against regime change operations, or at least that may be part of the plan. So, you know, this thing could go all kinds of different ways. It's a big step to make. And again, the fact that the neocons behave in this fashion is entirely predictable. It's what they always do. It's probably going to result in major problems in Pakistan. It's going to increase anti-Americanism in Pakistan. And I know lots of people from Pakistan, by the way. And there's a very, very big Pakistani community here in Britain. And from what I hear from them, uh, um, anti-Americanism in Pakistan is off the scale. I mean, it is, this is a deeply anti-American country nowadays. From having once been very pro-American, it's gone absolutely in the opposite direction. So it's going to increase anti-Americanism in Pakistan. It's going to increase its stability in Pakistan. It's probably going to result in a prolonged political crisis in Pakistan that might eventually lead to the army again taking over in Pakistan. And, of course, it's going to have reverberations around the world with some governments um, either trying to do what Obrador has done in Mexico, which is, you know, appease the Americans, others going all the way, you know, saying, you know, we're with you, USA, you, we will do whatever you want because we're afraid, afraid. Still others nervous of their people and others still looking to the Chinese and the Russians, especially the Chinese, to come to their protection. I wonder if this hardens or softens uh, India's position as they're harden looking it. on. It will harden it. One of the big differences with India, first of all, India has a massive military establishment. Secondly, Modi's government is huge, you know, Modi's government is very consolidated. It has a huge amount of support in India. There were local elections in India and Modi's party did very well in them, to a lot of people's surprise. But thirdly, the Indian opposition, the Congress party, I would have thought, given its history, would be extremely loath to play this sort of game as the opposition in Pakistan has done. I mean, the pro-American party has historically been Modi's, not Congress. So I, I would have thought India would be quite different, actually. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll continue to follow this story. Uh, TheDuran.Locals.com, everybody. If you're watching this from Rumble, you'll see a maroon red button up top. Just click that button and you'll get taken directly to our Locals community as well. And go to the Duran shop, click on, uh, use the code, not click on, use the code, good day. And you will get 10% off all merchandise. Take care.